I've been doing a little series with you the last uh, two weeks on seasons in the spiritual life. In the first week, we talked about the season of spiritual seeking. And we talked about folks that come seeking a panacea, some kind of cure-all thing. And those that come seeking prosperity, they want to come to God and God's going to give them that extra voltage that they need to be what they really want to be. And then we talked about the sincere seekers that come saying, I know that I'm needy. I know that I need the message of Jesus Christ and his love and the cross and I'm willing to acknowledge my sin and repent and come to Christ. And last week we talked about spiritual infancy. We talked about the, the importance of four ingredients becoming a part of our lives. Teaching, prayer, fellowship, and communion. We reminded you there's going to be a communion service here Thanksgiving Eve at 7 o'clock. I expect this building to be full. I expect you to demonstrate your own gratitude to God for your salvation, that which you can get in no other place except from God himself through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. I expect you to take time to come and get on the spiritual side of things. And we had a good time talking about that, but today I want to talk about spiritual adolescence. And if you are an adolescent, if you are still a chronological adolescent. Don't get up and run away or don't get bent and turn me off. Just hang around, will you? Because you're going to be glad you hung around. You're going to learn some things as you uh, listen to this service. You're going to learn some things that you're going to say, I'm really glad I stayed. Now, adolescence is a very interesting time in life. You know, it's a time in life we've either all been through it or we're going through it or we're destined to go through it somewhere along the way. Still young enough, haven't gotten there yet. And, and it's a time where we know all we need to know. You know, we, we know what the game is, we know what the score is, we know where the post-game party is. <laughs> Does anything else matter? You know, that's about it. Let's don't get all shook up about what we're gonna do for a living or, or how we're gonna get along down through life. Today is the day, man, live it up, enjoy it, go to the fullest. and. When folks come along and try to get in the way of those who are in an adolescent situation and with an adolescent attitude, you see, our problem is we've all spent time in what we call Hard Knocks University. The school of Hard Knocks, Hard Knocks U. And we don't want others to go through that. But our efforts always seem to be futile. You just think about the times you have sat with people and they've told you. Some dad telling you about sitting with his son and saying, son, I really don't want to pick your friends for you. However, the crowd you're running with, mm, they are bad news. They're going to get you in trouble. And have a kid say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, Dad, wait a minute. No, son, they're, they're, going to, they're, they're bad news people. Well, you don't know them, Dad, like I do. You know, thank God, if he knew them like you do, he'd throw you out too, you know? <laughs> you don't know them like, and you know, it's four or five or ten years later and you've really gotten thick with that crowd and you've run the trails with them so long. You're in trouble. You're in jail. You've been in a bad accident with a bunch of these bad actors. And the last thing you want to hear your dad say is, I told you so. Can't stand that. Trying to keep you out of hard knocks you. Or that conversation between a mother and a 16 year old daughter just saying, honey, I wish you were dating some guys who were in high school. These older guys are going to get you in trouble. And having a daughter say, Mom, but he's so mature and he treats me so wonderfully well. Mom, you just don't understand. And then when the problems come, and she finally wakes up to the fact that he was treating her like he was treating her 
because he had a full-time job and he knew what he wanted. Tough to watch our kids go through that. You know, I can remember when I was a kid and my dad would often take me out into that double garage. We only had a double garage because we lived in a duplex. And the boss had a car in his garage and dad was the assistant. He had a car sometimes in our side of the garage. So it was a double garage. But he would take me out there and take that belt off and lay the buckle in the palm of his hand. I was always grateful for that. <laughs> Wrap it around a couple of times and then get me by the wrist and make me that old speech. It's going to hurt me worse than it does you. And I, used to, I used to think to myself, that is so tired. Just don't say, go ahead, beat the way out of me, but don't give me that speech. And then work me over to a fare you well. Because he said he loved me. I knew that he did, but I'll tell you what I really loved were the times when he got tired of doing that and he would decide he was going to talk to me. And he would tell, talk to me about discipline and responsibility. And I knew how to nod at all the right places. That's right, Dad. You're right, Dad. And you know, when I got out of his sight and out of his hearing, I would double over with laughter and the tears run down my face. I was so glad I got out of getting whipped. And he gave me this speech, but the speech was all baloney. All I could think, what does an Okie boy know about a kid growing up in Southern California? He grew up back there where there are cricks and bushes and cotton and Indians and all that, you know. He didn't understand Southern California. That was my playground. But I found out he really did care. And I found out he really had some great advice. And you ask yourself the question, does everybody have to learn the hard way? Does everybody have to go to hard knocks you? Well, there are three things we got to learn. And those three things are this. We've got to learn, I don't know it all. We've got to learn others older have wisdom that I need. And we must learn people who love us dearly and give us warnings and advice. Do it to help us, not just to try and control us. And when we start learning those things, the maturing process is underway. Adulthood is close. When we become teachable, when we respect others who have lived longer and have something to say to us out of their experience. Chronological adolescence and spiritual adolescence have tremendous parallels. In the last week, we talked about when a person is overwhelmed with the fact that they're sinners and they need to come to Jesus Christ for salvation for there's no other place to go. And they repent and they accept Jesus. Hallelujah, I'm on my way. Very exuberant. And then the exuberance begins to fade when they recognize that there's a price to pay that is higher than they thought. I have asked God to deliver me from ever telling anybody, you just come to Jesus and everything's going to be slick. I tell people, you come to Jesus and he will carry you through whatever the difficulty may be, but everything isn't going to be just peaches and cream. There are going to be some difficulties in life. Difficulties come in different ways. There's a relational price to pay. You know, there may be there's some of those great friends of yours that really like to go out and raise hell and carouse with you. And when you come to the place, you're saying, you know, guys, I'm really not into that. You know, I belong to Jesus. Now they may say, hey, you know something, get lost. And you're not willing for that. That rejection hurts you. I think about a, a man who came to Christ in this church a number of years ago. He was in a business partnership with three of the guys and the four of them in this business together and there were a bunch of hell-raising guys and they knew how to make a business go and carouse and all, really go to it. And this guy came to Christ and began to see his life turn around. Change is made. And one day the three guys got together without the fourth guy. They got together and they said, you know what? This guy's a drag. We don't want him around anymore. Let's buy him out. 
And then they called a meeting with the fourth guy and said, you know what? We don't want you around anymore. We want to buy you out. He said, there was a time when I'd have been so mad, somebody would have ended up bleeding in that room. But he said, I just said to him, okay, buy me out. Let's set a price. Let's work a deal. Buy me out. It's all right with me. There's a relational price to pay. There's a time price to pay. You see, if you as a spiritual infant are committed to teaching, to prayer, to fellowship, and to communion, it will take a large block of time and you do not have nearly as much what we call discretionary time anymore. Boy, a guy thinks I don't have time to do all those things I used to do. My old dune buggy's getting rusty because I've been sitting around here studying the Bible and going to classes, taking time to pray. I'm in a salt room. I'm fellowshipping with folks. I'm going to be at communion on Thanksgiving Eve. I expect to see this building full. There's a time cost. There's an energy cost. You spend time studying the things of God and doing the work of God and being involved in being a servant of God and you'll find it's going to sap some energy from you. That emotional cost that's there. You know, I spend a lot of time in hospitals. I call on believers and non-believers because they're both kinds in the hospital. You know that? Believers get sick. Believers get all the diseases that non-believers get. Believers die of the same diseases that non-believers do. And sometimes when you're there, if you listen to my broadcast this morning, I was reading Psalm 27 where old David was so great in his praise, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? And then you get down the middle part of that and he's got the mully grubs. He said, oh Lord, don't let him get me. Lord, they're coming after me. Well, I'm afraid they're going to get me. You see, there is something about being real in the pressures of life that is very, very important for us as believers. There's a financial cost that's too high for some people. You know, when you come to the understanding that your stuff is also God's stuff and all your life you live to the notion that your stuff is your stuff and that's it, and that God says, I regularly want a portion of your stuff to help get my work done across the world. And you begin to dig your heels in and begin to say, how in the world am I going to make it? I haven't been able to make it on what I've had. Now I've got to give God part of this. What kind of deal is going to work? People get dug in. Now let me tell you this. When you begin to learn that Jesus Christ demands, get that word straight, he demands to be the unquestioned ruler, the master, the Lord, the president, the CEO, the ultimate authority in your life and in my life as his children. When you begin to get that message, then something good is about to start happening. But you see, it's really unnerving to independent-minded American believers that God would say, that he expects, in fact, he demands, he wants to be the king of my life. We easily get to where we're asking the questions, what about my agenda? What about my aspirations? What about my wishes? What about my desires? What about my wisdom? After all, I got where I am. I was somewhere along life's way doing pretty well when I came to Jesus. What about all of my wisdom? And rebellion takes root. And it grows rapidly. We ignore Colossians chapter 2. Last week, this was your assignment. I'm sure some of you stumbled on this a time or two and finally said, I'm not reading that anymore because Colossians 2, 6 says this, and now just as you trusted Christ to save you, trust him too for each day's problems. Live in vital union with him. Let your roots Grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him. See that you go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Let your lives overflow with joy and thanksgiving for all he has done. You don't like that. You don't like that because that's putting those demands on you of teaching and of prayer and of fellowship with believers 
and commitment. And it doesn't take long that the spiritual infant gets to the place to where he becomes the spiritual adolescent. And some things just surely begin to happen. One is he begins to become a Bible editor. He begins to become a Bible editor. Maybe this has happened to you. You underline the passages on love and on grace and on God's concern for us. And you begin to dismiss the passages on holiness. I mean, nobody can do that. On purity, on honesty, on loving the unlovely. You dismiss all of that, just set it aside. You don't want to read that. You just get like somebody that's going down here to the Piccadilly cafeteria. You start walking down the line and hear all these beets and Brussels sprouts. You say, boy, I don't want any of that. I'm not touching those things. I was at a luncheon the other day where they had this salad, and on this salad they had one slice of beet. And I wasn't doing survey for a message, I just happened to look at the guys, most of the guys at our table did not eat, as the waiter was coming to pick up the salad and get out of the way to bring the entree, did not eat that beet. And I said, what's with you guys? Beets are built to eat, they're not just built for color in a salad. How come you, oh boy, I don't like beets. See, we go down here to the Piccadilly and we walk down the line, I don't want any beets, Brussels sprouts, God never intended anybody to eat those. You know, we look at stuff and we push it aside. We get down the other end, tapioca pudding, man, there's cherry pie, oh, look at all the great carrot cake, we see all the good stuff, and we just pull it in. We think we can do the same thing when we're dealing with the things of God and we get self-deceived and we refuse to do what he knows is right and what his word declares to be right and we get into a pattern of living that says, I want to sign up for Spiritual Hard Knocks University. Hebrews 12, let me read this to you. Hebrews 12, just listen. Beginning of verse six, great passage for believers. God says, have you quite forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you, his child, when he said, my son, don't be angry when the Lord punishes you. Not if the Lord punishes you, but when the Lord punishes you. Don't be discouraged when he has to show you where you are wrong. For when he punishes you, it proves that he loves you. When he whips you, it proves you are really his child. Let God train you, for he is doing what any loving father does for his children. Who ever heard of a son who was never corrected? If God doesn't punish you when you need it, as other fathers punish their sons, then it means that you aren't really God's son at all, that you don't really belong in his family. Do you hear that verse? If you are living in sin today as a believer, continual, constant sin, shacking up with somebody, public drunkenness, doing the kinds of things dishonestly, operating in a pattern and a plan that is outside the known will and word of God. Listen to what it says. If God doesn't punish you when you need it, as other fathers punish their sons, then it means you aren't really God's sons at all, that you don't really belong in his family. If you're living that I'm going to go for the gusto life and this is it and I only get one trip around and trying to hang on to the things of God with one hand and live that way on the other hand and God is not in the process of punishing you, perhaps you need to look and say, do I really know the Lord? Am I really a child of God? That's what the word says. Since we respect our fathers here on earth, though they punish us, should we not all the more cheerfully submit to God's training so that we can begin really to live. Our early fathers trained us for a few brief years, doing the best for us that they knew how. That's a great statement, I love it. A lot of us dads in this place wish we could go back and do the job over. We would be kinder, we would be as firm, but we'd find different ways we don't have much training to be fathers. That's why I'm pushing dad the family shepherd with this crowd to get our men there to learn what they need to learn. Young men, fathers, grandfathers, how to be what you ought to be. Our earthly fathers trained us for a few brief years doing the best for us that they knew how. Don't spend your life putting yourself down, dad. You did the best you knew how. 
But God's correction is always right and for our best good that we may share his holiness. There's that word again, holiness, purity. Being punished is not enjoyable while it's happening. It hurts. But afterwards, we can see the result. A quiet growth in grace and character. And the next verse says, get a grip. You didn't know that's where it came from, did you? Romans 12, 12, take a new grip on your tired hands. Stand firm on your shaky legs and mark out a straight, smooth path for your feet so that those who follow you, though weak and lame, will not fall and hurt themselves, <coughs> but become strong. There's some people following you. There's some people following you. And you need to walk a straight path of doing what is right. So that as they follow you, they're not going to fall and hurt themselves, <coughs> but they're going to become strong. Now, your assignment for the week and the final point of the message, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You're to read that entire chapter every day and add to it chapter 7 and verse 1. That's a wrong chapter division there. <clears throat> the first verse of chapter 7 belongs with all of chapter 6. That we are to purify ourselves in body and in spirit, living in the wholesome fear of God, giving ourselves. Because you see, the other thing we do, in addition to becoming editors of the Bible, we make a major mistake. Verse 14 says, do not be teamed with those who do not love the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be teamed. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And I believe he's talking about two binding relationships here that are prevalent in our society. One is to enter into marriage with an unbeliever knowingly. And two is to enter into business and become a partner of an unbeliever knowingly. It is foolish. It is against the will and the plan of God. And he makes it so plain. Says that one thing, do not be teamed up with those who do not love the Lord. And then he asks five questions. And the answers are just straight on all of them. He says this, what do the people of God have in common with the people of sin? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? And how can a Christian be a partner with one who does not believe? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? And yet I watch it over and over and over again as a pastor. Boy, some guy is down at work and he runs into some little Vanna White clone, you know? Man, she is the stuff. And after a whirlwind courtship, he's in my office saying, I want to marry this little honey, and she is dynamite. And we begin to talk about a relationship with God. Where is that relationship? And you find out there is none. And you talk seriously about breaking the word of God. No business getting into this binding relationship. It is diametrically opposed to scripture. What do you do with it? Well, you know, that'll come along just a little time. You know, it's great kid. Oh, she's wonderful. And you see him down the road. And you see him leave the areas of fellowship and the areas of teaching and the areas of prayer because the pull is too great and attempt to live life in a relationship where there is no fellowship in the key area of life. You see, we are told not to be involved in entanglements of this world in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And when we get involved in the entanglements of this world, we have no time to build an authentic relationship with God we have no time to advance his purposes here on this earth. And yet you listen to the speeches that I listened to as a pastor and that every person on this staff listens to over and over again. Hey, don't worry, God. I can do it all. 
I can climb the corporate ladder. I can work 70 hours a week. I can keep the home fires burning. I can shoot golf in the 80s. I can do all the 10K runs around town. I can see all the latest movies. And I can still find time to commune with you, God, and worship you and find a place of active service for you. Baloney. And we make that speech to God like he's the dumbest thing in the universe. Like he's going to listen and say, oh, bless your little pea-picking heart. Aren't you wonderful? Instead of saying, don't you know how to read? Don't you know how to listen? Don't you know how to obey? Won't you listen to my word? We do our own thing. We refuse to acknowledge that God does not choose to be just another ingredient in a happy life. Well, add in a little God. Well, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I know I ought to be there more often, but and I'm really busy. Yeah, I've, I've thought about Bible study. I, I probably ought to show. I've thought about a salt group, but I really don't want to get locked up with a bunch of folks and talk about what's happening. Yeah, I know I've been through Timothy and I don't take, but you know, I... Let me tell you something. God insists. Get hold of that word. He demands that he be in charge of our lives. And I know this. I've had phone calls. I've had letters. I've had a lot of personal conversations with people in the last week who said, man, you were really mowing me down last Sunday. You nailed me to the wall last Sunday with that message question I've got for you this Sunday is this. Did you renew your commitment and change your lifestyle? Or did you tell yourself you were going to do something and the truth is you've slipped right back to where you were in the same sinful practices that do not honor the Lord and do not honor his word and give you no time and no place to be what God intended we ought to be. See, a lot of guys get discouraged and quit the pastorate. They go do something else. They find a different kind of job. They get in a Christian organization where they just work with Christians and they don't have to go out and deal with the unsaved crowd and deal with a crowd of believers that are not living up to par that absolutely inhibit the work of God. Guys get tired. Guys get discouraged. I just happen to be put together with a lot of grit and a lot of guts and I don't get easily discouraged. Partly because God has given me a great ministry on the side. Not because I'm behind this pulpit, but because I'm in this community. Wherever I go, I'm talking to men and saying, what's happening? I'll tell you, I had a great time last Tuesday going over to CBNC and taking two guys with me that need to know Jesus. And listening to Daryl Rogers give his testimony of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Great time for me. That isn't because I'm a pastor. That's because I'm a believer. I won't go to those meetings if I don't have somebody that needs Jesus. I don't need to go over there and buy my meal and sit around and say, oh, isn't that wonderful? I just got so blessed. I want somebody there that needs to hear it. When I listen to that man that I took coming back to his office, asking the questions and making the observations coming off Daryl's talk, I just know God's at work. It excites me to be in the work of God excites me to be encouraged. And I had one of the most tremendous encouragements this week from a man in this church I want to tell you about. Wednesday night, Roberta and I went to the Fresno Athletic Hall of Fame dinner. Six guys were going to be inducted. Two of them have connections with this church. Darrell Rogers used to teach Sunday school for us years ago when he was coaching the Bulldogs. Glenn Hippensteel is currently a part of this church. Great tennis player, great national champion. Marvelous guy. And each man, as he was inducted in, had an opportunity to make a speech, whatever he wanted to say to the crowd. He had a few minutes to do that. Glenn talked about his life and how great it was to be a champion and, and the fun he'd had being a father-son champion nationally with his son, who is now playing father-son matches with his son. And it was a wonderful testimony. And then he came to a place and he said, in 1982, I was really struggling physically. I was depressed. I was seeking peace. And he said, I found it when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. 
450 of Fresno's finest sitting there. And here's a guy who just gave his testimony. He didn't preach a sermon. He just said, I found it when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I don't know what's happening to you. I don't know where you're searching for peace, but I want you to know something. There's only one place that it's available, and that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he said, I thank my wife, Kathy. She prayed for me and loved me many, many years before I finally came to Christ. And he said, Buf Carriker and Lou Herwald. And Louie and I happened to be sitting together at the table out there. But Louie was the guy that was taking him through Timothy that I had set up when Glenn gave his heart to Christ. I tell you, that'll excite you as a pastor. And as I went after the meeting was over and I found Glenn, and I stuck my hand out and I said, man, that was tremendous. He was like a 10-year-old kid looking for approval. He said, did I do okay? Did I do okay? I said, did you do okay? It was incredible. Somebody in that crowd, the place was as quiet as death. And somebody in that crowd, when he said, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, somebody in that crowd, mm, just groaned. Didn't slow him down. He doubled up and hit it again and then hit it one more time before he quit. I tell you something, folks. That's a step towards spiritual maturity. No spiritual adolescent living in rebellion would stand and do that with that kind of a crowd and figure on the consequences. But Glenn did, and I say that all to the praise of God. He was in the early service. It was such a delight to see him. Times are tough for Glenn right now. That hip is hurting like everything. But he can still stand and give testimony because he's walking with the Lord. I want you to read 2 Corinthians chapter 6 to the end and then read verse 1 of chapter 7 every day. And if you have the courage to think about whether or not you got yourself lined up for God's punishment, go to Hebrews 12 and start at verse 5 and read through verse 13, 14, and just see what a good father does and God is the most incredible father we will ever have. He will, he will deal with us as his children, as a loving father should. Oh, bless you. I'm glad you're here. Stand together with me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your loving care for us as your children. And I pray that people will walk out of here today saying, I, I need to do some reading in Hebrews 12 as well as 2 Corinthians 6. I need to do some checking up. I've got a lifestyle going that does not honor the Lord. I am living in open sin. I am living in secret sin. I am not willing to declare what I ought to declare. I am hypocritical in what I'm doing. Lord God, I pray. This would be an incredible week in the history of this church. Bring us back tonight. Just a great time to get blessed. Music. Some of our ensemble crowd is going to be singing. and It's going to be a good evening. Bless us, Lord. I'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you.